Um, okay. Great. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Monty Hardcath Conference. Um, as usual, we have a fantastic speaker and a really good friend, Dwayne Pinto from Boston, from Bath, Israel. Uh, Dwayne is truly an expert on coronary structural interventions. And recently, besides, I guess, clinical medicine wasn't exciting enough for him, so he's decided to take on a second role, and he's become the chief medical officer of Yena Valve. I won't tell you what Yana Valve is, but um, I'll have Dwayne tell you about that. But uh, Dwayne, I'm super excited for you. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to help this technology get to patients and benefit patients. And I'm sure it must be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person and hearing how things are going. Yeah, thanks a lot, Azim. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, so first, you know, when I was interviewing for the job, uh, I had to really ask, is it Yenavalve or is it Genevalve? And apparently, uh, if you're in Europe, it's Yenavalve. Uh, and in the United States, we call it Genevalve. So, okay. you know, Azim, you're, you're kind of be, uh, betraying your roots uh, by uh, calling it Yenavalve. But, yeah. you know, first I want to kind of go back uh, to, you, you know, some basics about aortic insufficiency and such. And, and one of the things is, um, I think we're going to come to find in the coming years that uh, aortic insufficiency is like the uh, the forgotten valve. If that's uh, your specialty, Azim, the tricuspid valve, then this is the forgotten disease state of the of the aortic valve. And um, you know, I think just to review some of the physiology too of uh, of why it's um, it's uh, a challenge is uh, first, we don't even know what to call it. If we can't even figure out whether it's TAVI or TAVER, how will we ever figure out if it's AI uh, or if it's AR? Um, but you know, I think if you recall um, the physiology of aortic insufficiency, it's almost like it's aortic stenosis and the mitral regurgitation at the same time. Not only do we have the volume load that occurs with aortic insufficiency, but we also have uh, this pressure load that occurs throughout the cycle where there's increased afterload. So that's why we get this so-called core bovinum, uh, the enlarged heart and such. But that's also why we can't necessarily treat it the same way as we treat uh, aortic stenosis. First of all, the diagnosis is very uh, much more difficult uh, when it comes to uh, non-invasive imaging, uh, but also too, uh, we are, our paradigms for treatment perhaps should be closer to how we multiple, uh, manage mitral regurgitation. Uh, but there's obviously a significant undertreatment of disease. And as you showed in your case, there's no adequate solution. So, uh, uh, percutaneously. So there's a clear unmet need and an op opportunity, uh, for us as clinicians, as well as, as an industry. So first, um, you know, everybody tells me, you know, I don't have that many aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation patients. Uh, there's not ma that many out there. Um, well, I'll show you from the European Heart Survey uh, that there are a substantial number. If you look on the left-hand side, stratified by age, uh, those are the number of aortic stenosis patients. And we're, we know the aortic stenosis, stenosis patients pretty well. Those are the patients that we're getting referred for TAVR, um, and you see that the aortic regurgitation patients are a, indeed a large proportion there, uh, estimated to be somewhere around 15, 20 uh, percent of those patients. The M off to the right is multivalvular disease, uh, another group of patients where we don't have a large uh, uh, database of knowledge. How do we manage somebody with combined regurgitant disease or stenotic disease? Um, but if you focus over there on the left-hand panel, uh, of course, there are uh, the patients skew to a little younger, um, but also uh, we see that these patients uh, are also suffering complications. So uh, the other thing that I hear very frequently about aortic stenosis patients is they're doing fine. I have them in the clinic. Uh, they're doing fine. They're not, uh, you know, symptomatic and such. And 
Indeed, if they're in your clinic and they're not symptomatic, uh, the mortality is quite good. Um, and it's acceptable uh, per year, perhaps uh, higher uh, than somebody without valvular heart disease. But as soon as they develop symptoms, uh, their mortality is quite high. And you can see uh, as, uh, around a 25, 20% mortality at one year if there's class three, four symptoms. Now, obviously it's not as uh, scary and dangerous as uh, aortic stenosis um, when we estimate the, the risk of major complications to be quite high. But I would say that this is much higher than uh, even with cl class one symptoms than some of the other disorders that, that we manage. So for example, uh, if you look at, at the far left, it's very well accepted for cas catheter-based therapies uh, in non-STEMI in this case uh, to uh, utilize them almost uniformly whenever we can. Uh, and that's for an outcome of death MI or rehospitalization. Um, and when you look at the... Uh, aortic insufficiency population, you see that the absolute rates of complications are much greater. And uh, we've been held back, I think, in disease recognition and management by not having adequate catheter-based therapies. So what we're blinded to, as we have been time and again, uh, are for the patients that are candidates for our therapies, uh, whether it's left atrial appendage closure or mitroclip, or uh, when it comes to pulmonary embolism treatment, when we start to have treatments that work and are uh, acceptably safe, we begin to see the patients uh, and recognize that they're there. And it doesn't take much uh, as far as an improvement in outcome for us to adopt these uh, therapies. So uh, let's get to some of the challenges that we face um, when it comes to making the diagnosis of, uh, of aortic insufficiency and identifying uh, the severity. So uh, there are a number of quantitative measures uh, of aortic insufficiency that you all are probably very well aware of, and that's the pressure halftime, the PISA radius, the measurement of the vena contracta, or the identification of flow reversal. So of these four parameters, looking at these echoes, which I would say are, are not uh, trivial to obtain, somewhere around a fifth to a half are not usable. And uh, so if you look at what is perhaps something that's not widely available, but may be able to quantify aortic insufficiency better, around 45% of moderate to severe uh, patients have severe disease, and around 7% of people with mild disease have severe disease. So what that tells me is that the criteria, which you can see here for aortic uh, insufficiency by echo are a bit like rolling the dice, because if you look here, the, the criteria are to have greater than equal uh, uh, two to three criteria, uh, sorry, for severe AR. Um, and if you aren't able to obtain the criteria, I don't think that the case is that you uh, have moderate disease, but rather uh, we had an ineffective testing strategy. And I think that also, um, I don't know if your uh, uh, echo lab routinely quantifies ventricular volumes, rather than linear dimensions, but not all echo labs do. And so if we're trying to identify whether somebody has severe AR versus not, um, I think it's sometimes very challenging. Um, and there are obviously these caveats that we have to be a limit, uh, aware of the limitations like in mitral regurgitation of color flow with eccentric jets. But it's also, listen, I'm just an interventional cardiologist, but the idea that you can have two severe criteria and you end up having moderate disease, it seems to me that if it's severe, it's severe. So I just think we need to get 
uh, a little better uh, when it comes to quantification of, uh, of aortic regurgitation because there are a number of patients and we've seen that the mortality when you have moderate disease is actually closer to the mortality of severe disease uh, than it is to patients who, who are doing just fine. So what that tells me is that we have a problem in classification rather than uh, the actual physiology of moderate AR is moderate. So um, with that long-winded uh, uh, issue, here is uh, what the guidelines are for aortic valve replacement. And you know these data and recommendations come from um, information that's sometimes more than 20 or 30 years old. And again, it is based on the idea that surgery it was the comparator. And so obviously with something that's invasive in people who uh, may have comorbidities, uh, the timing of equipoise is different than when we have catheter-based therapies. But nonetheless, uh, we await symptoms and the signs of uh, ventricular damage like uh, ventricular dilation or drop in the ejection fraction. And so when someone has uh, severe aortic regurgitation and symptoms, and you can see at the bottom if their ejection fraction is reduced or uh, their ventricle is starting to dilate, uh, then that's what the class one indication is for surgery. As we talked about earlier, uh, we know that aortic regurgitation is a volume load that dilates the ventricle accompanied by a pressure load during systole. So it's somewhat puzzling to me that the ventricular dimensions and the development of symptoms don't mirror the findings that would refer for repair or replacement when it comes to mitral regurgitation. Uh, in fact, I would submit that our cutoffs where the ventricle dilating to 25 millimeters per meter squared is actually uh, too high uh, for our patients. And we see that actually cutoffs uh, in the 20 range uh, are associated with improved outcomes after surgery. And you can see here, despite the clear benefit of class one uh, recommendations, very few patients are referred for surgery. And uh, that's why I think when we look at our, uh, our numbers of patients undergoing SAVR for aortic insufficiency, they're actually quite low. But uh, when you see patients with severe AR, only about 20% are referred for surgery if their ejection fractions are in the 30 to 50% range. Remember, reduced ejection fraction is one of the indications. Um, and if their EFs are very low, then uh, the chances of being referred are in the 3% range. And uh, what's the most common reason for not, uh, not being referred for surgery is advanced age and comorbidities. Uh, and as I mentioned, the annual mortality of these patients is somewhere around 25% with severe AR and symptoms. So, uh, this obviously sets the stage for something uh, to fill this void when people are not surgical candidates. Um, but as Azim mentioned earlier today, there are clear limitations of the current TAVR devices uh, in AR anatomy. And uh, the patients have been highly selected. It's not feasible in all anatomies. Sometimes uh, the annuli are very large. Uh, there's a higher incidence of paravalvular leak uh, and a high incidence of needing a second valve, sometimes as high as 20%. Uh, but you can see here, paravalvular leak uh, is uh, unacceptable if we apply uh, current standards. The need for a second valve, somewhere around 5 to 20%. Uh, so there's a long history of off-label TAVR for AR. Uh, the case that Azim showed is, is one of, of many in the last 
uh, year in TVT, somewhere around 2,000 valves uh, were put in for primary indication uh, of aortic regurgitation. This is out of 87,000 valves done uh, last year. And a lot of uh, devices have been attempted both from a transfemoral and a trans uh, apical route. Um, and again, uh, looking at these larger meta-analyses of these reports, device success, somewhere around 80%. 80 uh, second valve, uh, as mentioned, uh, somewhere around 5 to 20%. In this case, in the uh, meta-analysis, somewhere around 10%. 30-day mortality for these patients, 10%, uh, and moderate to severe AR. So as I mentioned, um, the challenges of the devices are that the, often the uh, valves are not calcified, uh, so it's difficult to anchor. Uh, the valves thus may embolize uh, often into the ventricle, but sometimes also uh, into the aorta. I mentioned also large annuli. Uh, our de current devices sometimes are not able to deal with uh, perimeters that are, uh, are very large. Uh, sometimes the aorta is very dilated, uh, increasing our risk uh, for periprocedural complications. And then obviously uh, the risk of annual rupture, which we have in TAVR uh, regardless. Uh, so when we're putting in these valves uh, with current uh, um, commercially available valves, uh, it's sometimes hard to see uh, what is the right depth. We can't use the calcium as markers. Uh, it's difficult to obtain uh, uh, adequate seal. And then also too, uh, permanent pacemaker rates are, uh, are different when it comes to our aortic insufficiency patients compared with uh, our aortic stenosis patients. And I'll go through that in a minute. Um, so with that, I'm going to show you this uh, quick video of the valve that I've been working on. And that is the uh, Jenna valve. And I have to also mention my conflict of interest that, that uh, Azim mentioned too, is I'm the chief medical officer of this company. And the valve is still investigational. We finished our pivotal trial and uh, we're in follow-up. The uh, device will be submitted to the FDA, uh, the application towards the end of this year. Uh, but it, you can see the valve is highlighted by this locator technology that finds each of the uh, sinuses and we confirm uh, the valve is placed that way uh, within each of the sinuses. And then the valve deploys uh, uh, in a self-expanding fashion. That, in that fashion, the locators pull the leaflets in, increasing the valve to coronary distance, also preventing uh, deployment uh, extremely low. And then the uh, cells that I'm highlighting here are about 30 French in size. So with commissural alignment that is part and parcel of the procedure and large cell design here, we have uh, the ability to grasp the leaflets and preserve coronary access. So this can is obviously attractive for a variety of, of different circumstances, but these locators grabbing the leaflets and having a dual sealing mechanism uh, at the leaflet level, as well as the annular level, um, is, makes it attractive for uh, aortic regurgitation. So, uh, sorry, this is repetitive here. Uh, so to summarize, um, we have a twofold challenge with aortic regurgitation. We have the unique challenges of, of uh, TAVR for aortic regurgitation, um, but we also have the standards now that uh, have been set for TAVR for aortic stenosis. Given the low complication rate uh, and given the increased um, severity of illness and comorbidities that our patients have, in order to treat these patients, we need to have devices that uh, are appropriate 
when it comes to outcomes such as uh, paravalvular leak and procedural outcomes with, when it comes to vascular complications and stroke. So the bar has been set by TAVR in aortic stenosis and for our devices to work for uh, TAVR in AR, we have to at least uh, uh, provide that amount of benefit. So we have the opportunity because the road has been uh, paved by TAVR for aortic stenosis to move quickly and efficiently when it comes to aortic regurgitation. The clinical standards, the preclinical testing and regulatory pathways have already been established. But if we don't match the outcomes based on uh, what has been identified and provided for aortic stenosis, then uh, we're not going to uh, be able to uh, provide this therapy to our patients with AR. We do also, I think, have to learn uh, from elements that we've learned from mitral regurgitation, including the importance of heart failure management, as well as uh, selecting patients before they become too ill, their ventricles are too dilated, uh, and they can't benefit from these therapies. Um, and then future indication expansion, for example, uh, to our patients uh, who are younger who, who, or who have uh, fewer comorbidities is dependent on uh, showing that this valve is durable, uh, that we can access the coronaries appropriately, et cetera. I will say uh, that this valve uh, is available in Europe with both an indication commercially for aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. We see pacemaker rates uh, in the 13 to 18 percent range with this uh, valve. And that's obviously very high when it, co it compares uh, to AR our numbers for aortic stenosis. Um, and so if you look at the aortic stenosis population with the very same operators and very same valve, the rates are in the uh, three to 7% range. And uh, so what that tells me is that there is a difference in uh, the uh, disease state uh, perhaps the way that the annulus dilates, the way that the valve interacts without calcium with the valve is different. And um, we see this in other reports of aortic regurgitation, the pacemaker rate in some of the off-label uh, TAVR uh, cases is somewhere around 20% as well. So I think we're going to learn a lot more about this, but uh, before we move into the uh, lower risk uh, patients, we have, will have to understand um, which patients uh, should still undergo surgery because they, for example, have aortopathies uh, or are very young, uh, which patients are going to not do well long-term with the pacemaker, what are the risk factors for pacemakers that are different with AR, AR than with AS, and, um, and then we're going to have to learn for our younger patients uh, how to reoperate on patients with uh, TAVR valves uh, should they develop uh, uh, larger aortic aneurysms or complications and require a, a, a second surgery, uh, a second valve. Uh, so with that, I'll end. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free. Dwayne, that was fantastic. I think just highlighting this disease state that I do agree with you is forgotten and partly because we haven't had great solutions. Um, Dwayne, before we go to the questions, I mean, I think most people have not ever seen a Yena in valve. I'm going to keep calling it Yena valve, a Yena mm -hmm. valve implant. Would you have a case you can show us, please? I mean, I've seen a couple of live cases, but I'm sure most of the audience have never seen one. Uh, do you have a case handy that you could show us? Yeah, let me, um, while I'm pulling that up, you know, feel free to start with some of the questions because I have to pull it up from a different presentation. Yeah. So, I mean, the question I'm, I had really, and I'm going to let the, the fellows uh, start with their questions too, was really related to the, um, uh, the pacemaker rates. You know, when, when we've seen high pacemaker rates in AI with other valves, it's usually because we're not able to implant the valve where we want to. 
Um, this valve seems like it's going to implant always at the same height, right? Because you're grabbing onto the leaflets. Um, so I'm still confused, you know, what can we learn about what's different in these patients? Is it because of oversizing? We're oversizing aggressively. Is it there, there's something different about, you know, membrane septal height or their, um, their AV node? I mean, any thoughts on, on so far as you've been looking at the data, why the pacemaker rate is higher? Yeah, so uh, I have been looking at the data. There's, first of all, there's, you know, maybe this is by by chance or maybe this is part of the disease state. The prevalence of conduction disease is quite high. So pre-existing bundle branch blocks, prolonged PRs, et cetera, is, uh, is perhaps greater than in our aortic stenosis patients paradoxically because these people are a little bit younger. That's why I say a little bit paradoxically. Um, the other is that, uh, you know, maybe there is some sort of protective um, uh, uh, feature when it comes to uh, the calcium and, for example, LVOT calcium as it interacts with uh, the valve. But so far, the only thing, and by the way, larger annulus is also a risk factor for needing pacemakers. So uh, I think there's probably some combination of all of these uh, in our AR patients. Um, and you know the, the way that the, the, the valve also dilates uh, eccentrically uh, and, and uh, in a different way than with aortic stenosis. So I think it's some combination of all of these, but so far, one of the biggest predictors is the one you mentioned is the membranous septum length. Uh, so that holds true for both uh, uh, for both uh, AS and AR. And the way I kind of think about it uh, is that uh, when there's a short membranous septum, which is where the left bundle exits, uh, it's almost like there's a larger bullseye for when the valve sits. So if you have a long membranous septum, there's more chance of you missing the left bundle than if you have a short one. And chances are the left bundle, which exits in a variable way from the from the membranous septum, um, has a, 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 a chance to get out. So that's a long-winded answer, Azim, to say that there's more to come. You know, we're still learning about uh about this, but remember that when uh the newer valves came out with aortic stenosis, the pacemaker rates were in the 20, 30% range, even I think with uh, 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 Portico most recently, it's in the 27% range. So we do learn, uh, even though there are these locators, uh, if you push forward, you can make the valve go in a little bit deeper, one or two more millimeter. And uh, so I think that that plays a role. Uh, we can stay higher still, um, and perhaps we get a little more confidence with the clipping mechanism to do that. And uh, yeah, you know, we have been a little more aggressive with oversizing in general uh, when it comes to aortic insufficiency because we want to quote seal better. But that may not necessarily be need to be the case with AR where people have torrential AR and our goal is actually to make that, uh, uh, you know, uh, less perhaps trace or mild, uh, AR is okay. And we would give up some oversizing, uh, in order to, uh, avoid a pacemaker. What do you think, uh, Azim? Yeah, I think that's true. I think, you know, there's something different also about the pathology and so on. Um, that we really don't understand. And as we <clears throat> do more cases and learn more, um, we're going to have a better understanding. Because it wasn't, I must admit, in, when I've done off-label valves and gotten high pacemaker rates, they've usually been because I implanted the valve too low or I implanted a second valve in the first, right? Um, yeah. And I'm hoping that as we learn to implant this valve better, and more consistently, we decrease those rates. Do you have time for another question? I mean, we have lots of questions, but I just want to see if you have. Yeah, let's. Uh, no, I'm just. Uh, 
I'm, I, I, I can't multitask as well as I used to now that I'm getting old. So I'm like trying to pull up the, uh, the, uh, the, the thing, but, but ask, uh, ask questions and I'll keep, uh, keep okay. looking. So there's a great question from the chat from Saul Rios, one of our fellows who's asking, you know, considering the unmet clinical needs, um, are there other valves in development for pure AR? There are. Uh, there is a valve called J-Valve, uh, which works on a similar concept of, uh, of uh, anchoring with the leaflets. Um, and that valve is going to start uh, in early feasibility studies. Uh, there are also valves that are really more, uh, they appear like, let me pull up one of those slides. Hold on. Um, that one, I know where that is. Uh, 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 but suffice to say uh, that it, uh, there are other devices, but uh, they're uh, still in early development. And uh, some of them are in the EFS uh, um, state of affairs, while others right. are uh, uh, more advanced, uh, such as this one. I'm just going to pull up this slide here um, and then share. Uh, Okay, so I don't know if you can see the uh, screen. Uh, so this yeah, is the, this is the J valve, which you know has kind of a, a similarish uh, concept with uh, these hoops uh, that that come in uh, and and align in the cusp. It's a little bit of a of a shorter uh, profile, um, and again, this is uh, in EFS. This uh, this valve is being used also for aortic insufficiency with a, a very wide ceiling skirt here, but this is more of a conventional type of uh, a valve, um, you know, shape. Uh, and this, you know, uh, kind of bulbous protrusion here may uh, do a little more, uh, as as we talked about, as far as uh, needing to, uh, for pacemakers and such and. And may not have this kind of anchoring that's necessary when uh, clipping the the leaflets. This is also a device. Uh, Azim, you may be familiar with this one, but uh, also a, a clipping mechanism. And uh, this uh, device, the HLT device, is uh, has been uh, gone off the market. So HLT has gone off the market. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. 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 Um, so we had another question from the chat. Um, I kind of lost that question. I'm not Andrea Mignati. Uh, are you able to ask that question yourself? Um, rather than it was quite a long question, so maybe you want to ask. Uh, it. Yes, uh, yes, uh, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm having problems with my computer, I'm connected with the phone. Uh, I actually, yes, had the, the question is in regard to uh, finding the, uh, defining the right timing uh, for intervention. If uh, you have uh, any suggestion of uh, where is the field going in finding the best approach to risk stratified patients that are at risk of uh, developing either symptoms of severe eye, um, whether you think this is going to be more uh, imaging, uh, so echo data versus clinical data or biomarkers is like where do you see is uh, the future of uh, risk stratifying patients and uh, finding uh, finding the right candidates for uh, an early uh, uh, intervention. And the second question I have is if there's any substrate of patient that you see might benefit uh, from uh, uh, valve uh, repair versus uh, replacement, uh, possibly with uh, LV remodeling techniques or uh, any other um, any other intervention aimed at uh, the ventricle more than the valve replacement. Yeah, those are, are two uh, really uh, good questions. What I'll say is... Um, I think that the 
I'm going to throw it back to you guys as the fellows and young faculty that this field is going to be developed by you and your ideas and your uh, investigations about who are the right people uh, to uh, intervene upon with aortic regurgitation. I think that uh, right now where we're at um, is not serving the patients well, and we should be generating the evidence. Uh, and I think the strategy is solely based on some way of uh, of looking at the echo and talking to the patients has been, and you know, don't hurt me for this uh, pun has been insufficient. So uh, I think that we need to uh, go beyond the echo criteria. Uh, I think that it's not practical to get a really good uh, echo in all laboratories that get all of the impatience uh, to get all of the proper parameters. But just going back to first principles, there are patients who are waiting too long. They're suffering the consequences. And I think we should be intervening earlier. So how do we move upstream in the disease state and, and change the guidelines to show that your ventricle doesn't need to dilate substantially and you don't need to have profound symptoms for us to do something? So I think even more than aortic stenosis, when we move into moderate disease, um, we will be helping a lot more patients. Um, and I think if anything, aortic regurgitation is probably gonna be better uh, in moderate disease, mainly because many of these patients actually do have severe disease, but also too, you know, when you replace someone's valve with aortic stenosis, their ventricle, you know, gets better. Uh, patients with mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation, if you wait too long, their ventricles don't get better. So I think we are going to end up intervening earlier. We're going to be looking for signs of cardiac damage, like, um, is accepted in atrial, uh, in mitral regurgitation when there's atrial fibrillation. Uh, but we're going to see things like, uh, heart failure admissions with, uh, reduced ejection fraction, uh, in people where we have to either quantify the AR better with the CMR or uh, TE or CT, something or the other, but we can't just do what we're doing now, which is get an echo. And if it's moderate, say, oh, okay, let's uh, give them some more GDMT. Or if the, or if the mitral valve is leaking a lot, we'll clip them and leave the AR alone. I think we're going now that we'll have tools uh, we're going to have to say, okay, well, it's not just an imaging-based diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. And I'm going to go farther when it comes to the diagnosis than just getting an echo and believing that it really is uh, moderate. But I'm also interested to hear what you think. Yeah, I think also, you know, the other part is, is a aortic valve repair. I think it's a part that's growing. Uh, there's, there are more and more surgeons doing it, but it's still a very select group of surgeons who do aortic valve repairs. There's now a dedicated, almost sort of subannular stent they use to resuspend suspend the aortic valve. Um, but we again, you know, it sounds very elegant as a solution because you're not putting prosthetic a prosthetic valve there, but there's still so little data, Andrea, in this field. And certainly, you know, um, it's being done on young patients right now, but with very limited long-term data, which I always find very interesting how in surgery you've been able to do that. Um, but I think we're still going to have to learn a lot more in this area and whether those will give durable results because it's not innoc innocuous. I've had, I remember one or two cases when I was in Italy of aortic repair, one in particular of a young guy was in his 20s who ended up with left main occlusion from the aortic repair. So those procedures are also not innocuous. But anyway, Dwayne, show us this, show us this, I see you have a series here of, of Yana valves. Yeah, so this was uh, presented by Alex Tam uh, at TCT. And uh, here are, uh, is a patient with a perimeter of 90, uh, the, 
the largest valve on label treats uh, to 90. Um, and uh, you can see the different diameters wow. here. I would have thought uh, this was too big. Yeah, so on label actually, Azim is uh, is uh, up to ninety. Okay. For the largest valve, here's the uh, the TE, and uh, the way the valve comes in is it deflects uh, in this plane uh, with the delivery system. So this is the delivery system all the way to the ascending aorta. Mm -hmm. And then the valve comes in uh, and is deflected and these locators are uh, revealed. And then there's a rotating mechanism and you can rotate in the horizontal plane. And then with the catheter, in this case, it's a, an AL1, uh, you can show that uh, each of the leaflets is uh, caught. Uh, so you see here, you, you can see that the leaflet is caught by that locator, while here it was not. See the leaflet is up there. So by deflecting and changing the wire, you can uh, come in and grab this, in this case, the left coronary leaflet. Uh, this is uh, grabbing the right coronary and the non-coronary. And then here, after deployment, uh, this is the, the valve in place. And then this is the um, the uh, the echo afterwards. What's the learning curve uh, for implanting this valve? I mean, you think like you get proctored for like two or three cases and then you're good or you, it's like five to 10? Uh, I'll speak from my own experience, uh, Azim, uh, mm -hmm. with the simulators and, and two cases. Um, you know, I felt competent to do it with... Uh, support from a clinical specialist. Right. Um, you know, there are things like this, for example, like a very, so for straightforward case, I, I felt good after two, three uh, cases. And this is uh, perhaps, you know, on a uh, baseline of, of knowing TAVR well, right. uh, you know, you know the, the regular parts of TAVR for the newer types of things uh, that you have to learn with this valve, I think two or three cases and paying attention during the training uh, mm -hmm. and simulation is, is all that's necessary. But I think challenging cases like this, like a very horizontal aorta, I think uh, one will need, uh, you know, some help from a proctor or a clinical yeah. specialist. Absolutely. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll point out that, you know, the, as in everything with TAVR or in general with structural heart, the, uh, the clinical specialists have the most, uh, 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 experience. They usually have as much, if more experience than any of the operators. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that can help you, uh, navigate, uh, through, you know, some of these challenging cases, but you can see this very horizontal aorta where the catheter needed to be deflected, uh, wow. quite a bit. And, and this, uh, you know, grasping all the leaflets is a little bit challenging, but not impossible, obviously. And you see yes. the, uh, the final, in, uh, implant there. Um, and also just one more, maybe, uh, of a valve and valve with a freestyle. Let's just see if that comes. I'm kind of stuck here. But suffice to say, yeah. some of these other other cases up that kind of crash. Yeah, don't worry. I mean, I think we get the gist of it. Um, and I mean... I think it's a very unique valve for, for AI, but I think there's going to be a role for aortic stenosis as well. Um, as, and I think, you know, we're going to, as we learn more and more about the benefits of commissural alignment, um, and I think also, yeah, patients with low coronaries may benefit from a valve like this, and uh, where you're not pushing the leaflets out, but holding them against the new cage. Uh, Dwayne, do you, have, do you have some time for questions from the fellows? Yeah, of course. Uh... But uh, I will say, you know, we're going to eventually go into aortic stenosis. Our, uh, you know, our colleagues in uh, in Europe have the valve around 25% to 30%, uh, depending on the institution, um, of cases are aortic stenosis cases. Right. And they've been primarily selected for cases like uh, you describe. Uh, in Berlin, very recently, they treated 
a valve with 1.8 millimeter coronaries height. Wow. And uh, in our preclinical testing with valve and valve, we see that the leaflets are pulled in. So you increase the VTC rather than decrease it. Uh, so it may become something that's attractive um, for people at risk coronaries, either valve and valve or native vanulus. Yeah. And then you don't have to snorkel or do basilicas. We say that as because that's been something that in the last week we've struggled with a couple of cases. So <laughs> we, we well, kind you of know, thought about you and, and this valve and how it would have might have made our lives different. Yeah, well, it's interesting, too, is, um, you know, there's a tidal wave coming of TAV and TAV. Absolutely. And we have to consider whether commissural alignment is going to, with this valve, you're going to be stuck with the commissures that somebody else gave you uh, because you're going to align with those. So TAV and TAV yeah. is going to be special in that regard. It, with this valve, too, if you have a super annular valve and you're putting this in, what does that mean for depth? Uh, and such. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one consideration. But uh, just to let you know, there were 165 basilicas done out of the 87,000 uh, last year in, t in TVT, at least. Okay. And there were, uh, so this is not something that's, and, we, and you and I probably know the eight people that yeah. do it, you know, yeah. and, uh, and then um, for tab and tab, this kind of tidal wave of cases, there were uh, 450 done last year. Wow. So the the group of patients is uh, is developing still now uh, because early on in Taver, the patients were very high risk and are perhaps not around anymore. So I think we still have time to develop those techniques and 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 how to um, how to deal with these kinds of things. But uh, you know yeah. that's for the future. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's go through the fellows. Uh, I'm just going to go based on my screen. Julio. Hi, thank, Hi, you, thank you for the presentation. presentation. Oh, really? We learn a lot. A lot of <laughs> questions already <laughs> asked. Just one more. Um, you you said that Wait, you guys a... have a way nicer office than I had when I was a fellow, man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so do you have a size limit? It looks like it's uh, 29 millimeter of uh, mean diameter. But uh, how it works for large uh, diameter? Do you think there is an evolution? And how does the valve works on the bike speed patient? Thank you. Yeah, uh, two good questions. Uh, so the valve uh, treats up to a perimeter of 90. And I have to do the math what that uh, diameter is. Uh, but we're working on a larger valve, uh, which should come in a couple of years. Uh, Believe it or not, I'm learning now how long it takes to, you know, make these things. <laughs> if we were to start with a valve today, uh, it would take five years uh, to get a, like a new valve out. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the larger size valve actually j just needs to be made bigger. And that'll come sooner and that'll treat up to, uh, you know, closer to 100 um, <clears throat> as far as, uh, as the perimeter. As far as bicuspid valves. It's a really also good question, and I'm going to be somewhat evasive in that uh, the bicuspids come in different flavors, right? There's the Seaver Zeros with, you know, really two sinuses. Um, I'm not sure. So we haven't treated those, and I'm not sure that we should treat those because those patients are generally younger um, and, and may have an aortopathy uh, uh, associated. Those people are probably better treated with surgery. If those people are, low, if they're low risk, for example, if those people are high risk, um, I think that we still don't have enough evidence and I'm not really sure from a technical standpoint with three locators coming in, how do you, you know, manage that, that kind of two sinus concept? Um, there's a number of things that I think can be done, um, but I don't know whether they should be done. Then there's the usual, you know, uh, bicuspid that we see in aortic stenosis where it's a fused raffe. And these have sinuses that are often very distorted and such, and the calcium doesn't expand when you've done these cases. You see that the valve deploys eccentrically and such. And I think that we can uh, actually treat these patients uh, and will. And I think we're gonna see that done uh, off-label in Europe. Uh, the vast majority of information about aortic stenosis is gonna continue to come from Europe uh, because 
uh, you know, we're going to be only approved in the United States for for AR. Um, <clears throat> but what we're seeing is um, very good hemodynamics. The valve areas are huge compared to the commercially available valves. It's most often that we get gradients in the two to five range, um, regardless of anatomy. So if that holds true, this and and we can deploy the valves properly um, uh, with bicuspid anatomy, I think this might actually be something that's uh, quite favorable for that. But yeah. I think it's going to be different than aortic stenosis in that, you know, I I don't think that there's going to be equipoise. I wouldn't recommend uh, a TAVR in a young person uh, with a bicuspid valve and an aortopathy. I think that person should should still get surgery if they're low risk. Absolutely. Julia? Hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pinta, for this wonderful, this impressive the high mortality that of these patients, almost 35% of mortality at one year. So I have two questions. Is there any different approach of uh, in patients with aortic root dilatation? And the second question is, uh, in patients with aortic stenosis, what about the risk of PBL um, in patients treated with Genabal? Yeah, so I'll take the second one first, <clears throat> and that is we are seeing uh, with our European experience uh, very good results with regard to PVL. And uh, the valve I didn't highlight when I presented has a little bit of a flare as it comes out, and that's how it seals on the bottom. Um, that, when it's oversized, may increase the rate of pacemakers perhaps. Uh, but right now, when you're sized appropriately, we have uh, very good rates of, uh, of uh, paravalvular leak. Um, your first question was, uh, uh, remind me, now I'm getting old. Yes, I'm getting, yes of course. Person. No yeah. no, worries. It's, no, it's regarding a uh, different approach in patients with aortic root dilation. Oh, yeah, with the aortic dilation. So, uh, you know, the valve is uh, delivered through a delivery system that is placed at the sinotubular junction. And uh, there's not really a, and because it can deflect, you know, in this direction uh, with the delivery system, there's not a, a aortic diameter that is prohibitive. Uh, and, you know, we just have to be mindful of when you're, you're moving the sheaths in and out and, and you're deflecting catheters that you're mindful of avoiding aortic dissection. So there's not really a problem with aortic root dilation. There's a little bit of a problem with uh, aorta length because you need to have kind of enough room to, uh, to deliver and bend the valve. Not unlike when you come in for a mitral clip, for example, and you're going with your transeptal into the left atrium, you want enough uh, space to be able to turn turn the corner. Um, but what I would say, if someone has a really large aortic root and a really large aorta, we should be questioning why that person's not getting it repaired, right? And so uh, aortic valve disease plus very large aorta, we should be figuring that out. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then Julio, for you, uh, you should be figuring out how to dock a... Uh, a, a, a prosthetic aortic graft to the top of a genovalve so that we can do a fully percutaneous aortic root repair as well as a aortic valve replacement at the same time. But that's, you know, I'll be, Azim and I will be retired in the south of France. Right? <laughs> exactly. Maybe in the south of Italy for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Andrea? Hi, Dr. Pinto. Thank you for this talk. Okay. Just a couple of questions, uh, very quick. The first one is for patient with AI. Um, general, other than sizing, are there any unfavorable anatomic characteristics we should look for when assessing the patients? And then the second question is for when treating aortic stenosis, uh, it should be easier to grasp the leaflet, but at the same time, we have less time to check for a proper engagement. Uh, do we rely less on this step in this scenario? or which is your recommendations? Yeah, so uh, again, the first uh, question is the, the watchouts. 
Uh, I think uh, very horizontal aorta, I showed you a case like that. Uh, that's, you know, perhaps a little difficult, uh, but we've treated patients uh, in Europe in the 80, 90 range, but that's challenging for any TAVR. Um, I mentioned the short aortic length, um, being able to turn around the, the corner there. Um, and so uh, that and, and perhaps at risk coronaries, and if you have all, you know, some patients have all of these uh, factors and you're worrying, am I going to occlude the coronaries? Will I be able to grasp the leaflets? Am I going to create an aortic dissection? So like all interventional procedures, it's not usually one factor where you have to watch out. It's just knowing how to deal with multiple factors at once. Um, when it comes to uh, the finding the leaflets and all that sort of stuff in, uh, in aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, we aren't finding that the patients are very sick uh, when you're, you're doing this portion of the procedure because even though you have the wire across, uh, you're not uh, usually fast pacing when this is happening, um, it, meaning pacing at 180 or anything like that. You're, you're, you only deploy at, uh, at uh, a rate of 120 or 140. Uh, but while you're finding the leaflets and stuff, you just have the wire across and so you have enough time uh, to find the leaflets. Um, and then, you know, with aortic regurgitation, these patients have been living with a lot of aortic regurgitation uh, for a very long time. So the best way to make them more hemodynamically stable is to pace them at 80 or 90. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have plenty of time. You, the patient is actually usually more stable. Thanks, Dwayne. Uh, Manafa Samina, last, last question. If either of you have a burning question, otherwise I want to let Dr. Pinto go. I get the feeling he's somewhere where it's not 8.30 in the morning. Yeah, I'm actually in California. So, uh, okay. uh, you know, well, then I really appreciate you waking up so early for us, Wayne, and giving us your time. That means a lot. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks. My pleasure. Dr. Well, Pinto, thanks for the Usually, uh, if we were traveling, we might be going to sleep by now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, just a practical question about how you evaluate um, aortic regurgitation patients in clinic. Let's say you get a patient with um, uh, a transthoracic echo read of moderate aortic regurgitation who are quite symptomatic um, in your practice. Are you taking those patients to the cath lab? Are you ordering a cardiac MRI, TE, anything that makes you order one test over the other? Yeah. So um, what I'll say is this is a truism in my interventional career. I come to learn that I don't know squat uh, <laughs> over a long, like I didn't know anything about aortic stenosis and interpreting the echoes and what DVIs were and all this sort of stuff and actually didn't care because what, at most I was going to be doing a valvuloplasty. But like, and, you know, I knew intellectually about low flow, low gradient and giving some dobutamine and all that sort of stuff. And I became very good for very obvious reasons once uh, I started TAVR in non-invasive imaging. And uh, the same will hold true for you for tricuspid regurgitation. The same will hold true for you for aortic regurgitation as it is for MR for you right now. Um, so... I think the first is me looking at the echo myself and saying, you know, what, what, do, what does this look like? What do the leaflets look like? Let me see if they even collected the parameters to call it severe or not, rather than just looking at the report and somebody saying, oh yeah, it's moderate. And looking at whether there are other imaging modalities that have shown that the ventricle is dilated, seeing what the presentation of the patient is, uh, you know, is it really profound heart failure, et cetera, and just being a regular doctor. So what you're used to doing, you know, when you see an AS patient now, MR patient now is perhaps, and, and for your specific institution, a TR patient, because you have a, a zine, but you're going to apply that strategy to AR as well. And then locally, you'll, you have the capability of investigating with any of the things that you mentioned. And I personally would probably uh, start <clears throat> with uh, a, a CMR if they're an outpatient 
uh, because that's more practical and easy to get. Uh, if the person, for example, is in the ICU already, then that's impractical to get. And I would get a TE um, and ask it, them to really, you know, interrogate the valve properly, et cetera. So it kind of depends. One idea that I, I have is uh, in these people who get TAVR CTs is to look at the ventricle on the TAVR uh, CT and see if it's big and dilated. That requires, uh, you know, using the three mencio in a slightly different way than um, for aortic stenosis. But I think what fundamentally we shouldn't be giving up in a sick patient with heart failure when it's moderate, unless we're really confident that it's only moderate. And so getting some advanced imaging and assessing the patients ourselves is probably, I think, the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dwayne, thank you so much. Um, safe travels, my friend. I'm, I'm sure you're traveling a lot more than before right now. Um, and it's an exciting time um, for you and for the technology. We look forward to having it in our practice. And so best of luck with getting FDA approval and the other clinical studies. And yeah, uh, this is like really educational. It's, I think the whole well, you concept... know, if you have a patient, there's that community hospital somewhere uh, it's uh... called uh, Columbia. I don't know, there's that, there's, I mean, I don't know, it's uh, yeah. they, they have it is continued access, it's but, continued uh, access, yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to we'll keep that in uh, mind, have it, having it where the real people are in the Bronx, <laughs> absolutely. I, you know, it's interesting. I was having dinner with Nina last night. And we we're talking about you and Yana Valve, actually, you came up. Um, and I think it was interesting for me how five years ago, when we talked about pure AI and we talked, me and you were in probably ad boards, uh, and we said, ah, but don't bother with, a, with pure AI because the market share is so small, the number of patients to be treated are so small, and we're getting referred so few patients. If I go fast forward to today, we're getting referred a lot more patients with pure AI. And I think it's also because, you know, patients and referring physicians are seeing the great outcomes we're having with transcatheter therapies and aortic stenosis. And if there's an alternative to having a stenotomy to have the valve treated and it can give similar outcomes, that's what the referring cardiologists and patients want. So I'm seeing a lot more referrals than I did five years ago, a lot more for pure AI. And I think it's just because that mind, it's taken a while for that mindset to change and for patients also to start looking for therapies that are less invasive. So I think this is the right time for, for Yana Valve and, um, and for Pure AI. Uh, and I also thank you for pushing us to think a little bit about this disease. And, and maybe, I th and I know maybe, definitely, I think we've been waiting a little bit too long in many cases to treat patients. Uh, and that whole dynamic uh, about timing needs to change uh, as we learn more about the disease state. So listen, I, I thank you again. Can't wait to see you in person, my friend. Likewise, likewise. Okay. All right, Take guys. Care. All thank right. You.